Thank you, Wendell. I'm sure I will be repetitious with many others who have gone before and saying what an honor it is to be invited to be a part of this program, to be a part of a serious effort to come to grips with some difficult, some challenging, some often controversial matters that pertain to our proper study of the Word of God. I value the books that are being generated by these Fort Worth lectures. The books contain a wealth of information around specific themes and topics, and they're valuable additions to my library, and I'm sure you feel that way too. I appreciate also the willingness of the elders, the others involved in planning this program, to allow brethren to explore subjects of controversy like this war issue in a spirit of goodwill and mutual desire for the truth. I am not one of those people in our brotherhood who can claim never to have changed my mind on any issue. I didn't have it all right from the first day, and I'm still trying to be sure that I get more and more of it right as I go along. I have changed my mind, for example, on this very issue that I'm speaking on tonight. We plead for the hearing world outside our brotherhood to give rational consideration to our restoration plea and the doctrines distinctive to it. But sometimes we fail to admit our own need for humility and a teachable spirit. I think the, the very fact that both sides of this issue will be heard tonight indicates that we're trying to have the same spirit that we ask others to have when they come to hear us. The issues that are before us at the present time in our brotherhood, most notably one that I am not discussing, divorce and remarriage, threatened division and another bloodletting in the church. But so long as the attitudes of the disputants reflects a spirit of willingness to learn and to humble ourselves before God and His Word to be taught, unity can prevail. And I'm sure you join with me in praying that that will be the case on any controversial matter, and especially the one that seems to be occupying so much of our attention generally. As to the matter at hand, the taking of life in service to one's government, there was once a time when God entrusted both religious and civil authority to a single agency, or to say it another way, there was once a time when in the plan of God, church and state were one and the same institution. During the time that Moses was leading the Israelites in the wilderness, he wasn't just their spiritual guide and the Lord's lawgiver, but he was also the final arbiter of civil disputes, and he was the commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel. And in the days of Moses, the same man who served as God's spokesman to teach the law to that Hebrew people in the morning might sit in judgment in a civil matter that afternoon and impose a fine or a punishment or even the death penalty. As Hebrew history progresses in the later monarchy, there appears to have developed some sort of natural separation of powers within the nation. Kings and their ministers were in charge of the affairs of state. The priests and the prophets served to lead in spiritual matters. Yet the fact remains that as we study through the Old Testament, it's sometimes very hard to determine whether or not a given person is acting as a religious or a civil official in a matter. But since the Church of Christ has been established, a sharper line has been drawn between church and state. All authority belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth. And he's established the church as his spiritual body to be overseen by elders, to be governed by the New Testament, to be occupied with the business of evangelizing, preaching the gospel, saving souls. And he has also set up human governments and given them the task of maintaining order in society, enacting and enforcing laws and otherwise enabling people to live together in community. And Christians today have to face and resolve the issue of how our citizenship in an earthly state relates to our heavenly citizenship and our spiritual obligations within the kingdom of God. Students of the Bible who attempt to deal with this issue 
are generally agreed that Romans 13, the passage we're going to be studying tonight, is the single most crucial text to be studied. There hasn't been universal agreement as to its interpretation among us, and some godly individuals have taken it to bind them to a near total non-involvement in civil government, refusing to vote, some even refusing to pay taxes and being willing to, to suffer for their refusal. On the other hand, equally dedicated Christians have used it to rally patriotic sentiment on the 4th of July. The interpretations are radically different, but held by an equally conscientious brethren. Well, in this brief lesson tonight, I'm certainly not going to be able to resolve some of the more extreme positions that have been taken relative to this passage. I won't even raise a number of those more extreme cases. Instead, the issue for me to face, the issue that has been assigned, is the question of whether or not a Christian can participate in the vengeance-taking role of civil government. Is there any conceivable set of circumstances which would justify a Christian who is a duly authorized agent of the state in taking the life of another human being? Some of the practical implications of this very wide question are the following. Is it morally right for a young Christian to enlist in the armed forces? In a time of national emergency, should young Christians submit to draft registration and later conscription? Can a Christian be faithful to his Lord and serve as an armed member of a police force? Ought a Christian man or woman serve on a jury? when a capital case is being tried and where that person might be obliged to participate in the trial of an individual where the death penalty would be the likely sentence if he were found guilty. Could a Christian judge sentence a person to death in the case of such a verdict without committing sin? The position that I'm going to argue tonight supplies a yes answer to all these questions that I've raised. And the general thesis that I advance in support of my position is this. All actions performed under biblical authority as ministries to God are actions which are morally right and which should be supported by children of God. Now, this necessitates, of course, my arguing that the vengeance-taking role is an authorized activity of, of government, a ministry to God as it is performed. Surely my general thesis doesn't need to be argued extensively. It seems to me really that, that that's axiomatic, that any action performed under biblical authority as a ministry to God is an action that's morally right. Even Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament is called the servant of God when he comes against Israel. And he serves as the avenging arm of God to punish those people for their idolatries and other sins. Nebuchadnezzar was a wicked pagan, but in that act he was not sinning. He was a servant to God. Nebuchadnezzar ever paid his taxes or was faithful to his wife in a given situation, he was doing right there too. The fact that he was a pagan doesn't mean that everything he did was wrong. When he served God, even though he was not conscious of doing, doing so and punishing the Israelites in that, he was doing a right and a moral thing. Many of the armies that he led may have been going on campaigns that were sinful, but not when they went into Israel. Nero, that murderous, homosexual, bloodletting tyrant. Nero was the man under whom Paul would die as a martyr. And yet when Paul wrote Romans 13, Nero was already in his position as emperor. And Paul was encouraging Christians to pay improper respect and be obedient to Nero and whatever ever whatever other powers were in duly ordained positions in such matters as they were doing the right and opposing evil. Surely then my general thesis doesn't need a lot of argumentation. 
any action performed under biblical authority as a ministry to God is an action that's morally right. God knows everything that men will do in advance of their performing it. The Bible speaks of God's foreknowledge. Many things that God knows in advance of their being performed, He does not authorize to be performed. God overrules in His providence to bring about certain ends, but some things that are done in history are things that are specifically said to be done as ministries to God, as service to God. And in these things, it seems to me impossible that one should sin in doing a ministry to God. In order to justify the lesser thesis that must be proved that the vengeance-taking function of government is in the Bible identified as a ministry to God, we have to go to Romans 13. That's the primary text. The book of Romans consists of two principal divisions. First, chapters 1 through 11 develop the doctrinal theme of salvation by faith. It calls attention to the fact that all men need to be saved, that Christ's redemptive work is the basis of salvation, that faith rather than human merit is the means to that salvation, and that there's newness of life for both Jew and Gentile who receive this by faith. Then there is a second division to the book of Romans that begins at chapter 12. And the second half of the book, the remainder of the book, addresses the practical problems that challenge Christians in living their newness of life, in giving their spiritual service to God, as Paul calls it. There's first the matter in chapter 12, the first eight verses of the Christian's personal consecration, giving ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Then beginning at verse 9 and going through the end of the chapter, there's a discussion of Christian personal ethics. The ethics of individual action. Our action is private citizens in the kingdom of God and in the kingdoms of men. There is then in chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, the ethics of life within the state. Chapter 12 now, our personal ethics as individuals. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, our social ethics within society, under governments and organized groups. Then taking up at verse 8 of chapter 13, Going through the end of that chapter, love and hope is the foundation for all ethical behavior. And then in chapters 14, 15, the theme of learning to exercise forbearance and tolerance with brethren. Well, in giving guidance about right living, Paul writes about in chapter 13, 1 through 7, Christian conduct within a civil state, an earthly state. What he said was brief, but it serves to sketch out the broad outline of our duties to human governments. He didn't bring up all the specific questions that I raised earlier about judges sitting on a jury, policemen, soldier, death penalty. But he laid out adequate principles which serve to answer those questions. I want us to turn to them. What does the passage say? First, the passage says that the civil state is ordained of God. Verses 1 and 2. Let every soul be in subjection to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. And the powers that be are ordained of God. The word ordained uh, has to us a sort of a sacred sound. Uh, the word simply means instituted, set up, caused to be. Therefore he that resists the power withstandeth the ordinance of God, and they that withstand shall receive to themselves judgment. We don't know when or where the first non-family government, government was instituted. Nimrod's kingdom is the first one mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 10. Whether that's the first one or not, we have no way of knowing. Whether he set up his kingdom in response to a divine order or through his own initiative again, we have no way of knowing. 
what his name means, what we may think about civil governments in general, that doesn't indicate the circumstance under which he came to head a government. What we do know from Romans 13, verses 1 and 2, is that the principle of human government is ordained, appointed, set there as a principle by God himself. And by way of analogy, God has also approved of and ordained the principle of monogamous marriage, one man, one woman for life. No more than he approves the abuses of marriage does God approve the abuses of civil government. God is neither the author nor the defender of injustice, of oppression, or of other abuses of power within either government or marriage. The wife's duty to her husband, the citizen's duty to the government is submission. And only when submission to either husband or ruling authority, depending on which institution is being discussed, will entail disobedience to God and thus a violation of conscience can that obligation of submission be set aside. Governments are instituted then by God. They exist by divine right. Second, Governments are authorized to exist for this purpose, to encourage right conduct and to punish evil deeds among their citizens. Resume the reading at verse 3. Rulers are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil, which thou have no fear of the power. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise for the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. Now, as I indicated a few moments ago, when Paul wrote these lines... The infamous Nero was the emperor of Rome. The very man under whom Paul would later die, and evidently under whom Peter also died, as well as many other Christians. Well, this appears to answer the question as to whether or not we're obliged to submit to laws made by a government or passed by officials that we consider corrupt or unfair. Nero's right to obedience from the Christians under his rule wasn't personal. It wasn't contingent upon Nero's being a good man. It rested on the larger fact that he had an official capacity in a God-ordained institution called government. And as he was the head of the Roman government, he was entitled to submission from Christians. Third, civil governments are specifically said to have the right to bear the sword and administer punishment. Continuing the reading at verse 4, But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. He is a minister of God, an avenger for wrath to him that doeth evil. Now in chapter 12, verse 19, Paul has said, Avenge not yourselves, beloved, but give place to the wrath of God. That verse has forbidden private citizens as such to take the law into their own hands. Insofar as personal conduct is concerned, the Christian is supposed to return good for evil. That's verse 20 of chapter 12. The law of Moses taught the same thing. The law of Moses taught in Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18, that one could not under the law have an attitude of vindictive personal retaliation against one's enemies. The verses in question read, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt surely rebuke thy neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Thou shalt not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Jehovah. The prohibition of personal vengeance taking is not peculiar to the New Testament. It was there in the Old as well. That simply means that if something takes place that is bad in my presence, I don't have the right to get me a group of vigilante volunteers and take the matter into my own hand, take him out and string him up. It doesn't mean, however, that that person is to go unpunished or even that Christians cannot participate in his punishment. They cannot, as private citizens, take the law into their own hands, but that Christian who sits on the jury, who is a policeman, who is a soldier, it becomes his obligation to fill that role. The state and its agents, policemen, soldiers, etc., have the right to use force in the punishment of evildoers. 
the sword of Romans 13, verse 4, the Machaira, it's no ceremonial piece that the generals wore in parades. The Machaira was, was an instrument of, of death. That same word is used in various other places in the New Testament to identify uh, something with which one fights and injures an opponent and even takes another's life. It's an instrument of death. God gave that instrument into the hands of government and said that in the exercise of it, there's a ministry being performed unto him. Fourth, this passage teaches that Christians are obligated to respect and obey the government. Our reading continues at verse 5. Wherefore, ye must needs be in subjection not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience' sake. The Christian not only fears the punishing power of the state, the fact that it possesses the sword and the right to use it, but we also fear even more the consequences of resisting God by defying the very institution that God has set within society to keep order, the officer of the government. And then fifth, governments are entitled to tax their subjects for support. Verses 6 and 7, For this cause ye pay tribute also for their ministers of God's service. Notice this is the third time ministers of God's service, attending continually upon this very thing, rendered who all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Jesus himself had said this very thing about paying taxes to Caesar in Luke 20, verses 22 through 25. Now, there are three primary moves that one might make to try to avoid the force of Romans 13 as I briefly outlined the text. Some would concede the point that, yes, civil governments have a right to exist. Not only that, but they also have the right to bear the sword. But Christians can't participate in it. He can do it for us. He is the minister of God to thee for good. They can do it on our behalf. But we cannot fill that role ourselves. In other words, their position is that governments must exist, enforce laws, and even use force, but only sinners can carry out such deeds. I don't believe that that's a possible interpretation of this text. First, it would not be morally right for a Christian to ask anybody to do anything for him that it would be morally wrong for the Christian to do in the same relevantly similar circumstances. Anything that it is wrong for me to do, it is wrong for me to ask anyone else to do for me. He can't do my sin by proxy. It wouldn't be right for me to call on the police or the military forces to do something that it would be sinful for me to do if I were a policeman or if I had chosen to be a soldier. If shooting or otherwise using force against a criminal is immoral for a Christian who's on the police force, it's also immoral for me to call the non-Christian policeman to use force in protecting me. That's exactly what Paul did, though, in Acts 23, beginning at verse 16. Paul learned about a plot on his life, and he appealed to the Roman government for protection. Surely he had no doubt that the soldiers assigned to protect him and deliver him to Caesarea for security purposes would resist, even to the point of killing, if necessary, those who were plotting against him. And if the soldiers, Christian or non-Christian, who protected him, sinned in doing so, Paul sinned in calling on them. If Paul acted properly in calling for their help, though, the soldiers did a moral thing and performed a ministry to God in protecting him. It's ethically irrelevant to plead, well, the soldiers didn't have to use force on that occasion. The relevant fact is that Paul acknowledged their right to do so when he called for their service. Second, the duly authorized agent of the state who meets out vengeance to criminals is specifically called, I remind you again, the minister of God. Someone says, but he is a minister of God to thee, means that he, the man who isn't a Christian filling the role, does it for the Christian. God doesn't have two sets of moral laws. 
One reason why there is confusion over the divorce and remarriage issue is some believe that God has two sets of moral laws. He has one for people out here who haven't been baptized. He has one for those of us who are in the church. And these people who live under a different set of laws, they can divorce and remarry, but when they're baptized, everything is made hunky-dunky, as my little girl says. Everything's made hunky-dunky and they can stay together because only now has he become responsible to the moral laws of the new covenant. God doesn't have two sets of moral laws. Anything that he can do for me, I can do for him in a relevantly similar circumstance. The relevantly similar circumstance simply being if I hold that office or that position. The he is simply a generic term to be understood of a category of people. He, who's under discussion? Not sinners, but agents of the state, whether saint or sinner. Anyone who's in a ruling position, to thee, the person living within the society, calling upon, availing himself of their services. All general rules tend to be stated in this form. He that believes and is baptized so-and-so. He, the doctor, is a minister for removing appendixes to you. That doesn't mean that you, if you were a doctor, could not do it as well. The duly authorized agent of the state who meets out vengeance is a minister of God. And saint or sinner is bound to the same set of moral laws and whatever one does is an agent of the state, a sworn-in policeman, a sworn-in soldier, whatever. It's a ministry to God for the man who's a Christian or non-Christian. It's really impossible for me to understand how we could argue that only sinners could minister to God in civil affairs and that Christians would be morally wrong to perform a work that's approved of God and that glorifies God in the performance of the work. And third, it seems to me just intuitively offensive to hold that heaven has established a situation where sinners defend the property rights and lives of the Christians within a society while Christians on the sidelines pray for their success but insist that it would be morally wrong for me to do it if I were drafted or I were called on. Christians aren't exempt from the duty of providing for the welfare and protection of their families, their cities, their countries. Civil government is of divine origin. that God has originated civil governments and that they do exist by his divine authority must be the case or else God orders us to submit to Satan. When in Romans 13, government is said to exist by God's authority and we're to submit to it. Are we to submit to Satan? Civil government is either authorized from heaven or from a lesser authority. We're even told to pray for Satan and his works. If civil government is a work that has its origin in rebellion against God. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says that we're to pray for kings and all that are in authority. If people who fill these roles in the civil state are filling roles that Satan created, the Bible tells us to pray for people doing Satan's work. To acknowledge that the Lord is dependent upon Satan in some way or other is entailed in holding that civil government's not ordained of God, that civil governments are not of divine origin. Because in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 13, be subject to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Notice, for the Lord's sake. Is there ever any situation where we do something, put ourselves in submission to a thing that had its origin with Satan? For the Lord's sake? whether to the king is supreme or governor sent by him for vengeance on evildoers or praise to them that do well. If government exists by Satan's authority rather than God's, then Satan has a house divided. Notice the argument would go something like this. Civil government belongs to Satan, yet the Bible says civil governments exist to punish evildoers and praise good deeds. Therefore, Satan is engaged in punishing himself and opposing his agents while pressing righteousness. 
Satan's house is not divided. Civil government exists by God's authority. Therefore, the notion that Romans 13 can have its force mitigated by claiming that, look, these are obligations that some people can perform, but not Christians, is without merit. God only has one set of moral laws bound on all men. Second, it seems that you could evade the force of Romans 13 by arguing that Jesus' teachings contradict the interpretation of Romans 13 that I've offered. Didn't Jesus say, you've heard it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say resist not him that's evil, and whoever smites you on your right cheek turn to him the other also. Well, in the statement that I've just quoted from Matthew 5, 38 and 39, Jesus is discussing what Paul was discussing in Romans 12, the ethics of personal conduct. His words agree with what Paul said in Romans 12. Both Jesus and Paul prohibit personal retaliation. They condemn taking the law into your own hands. It's a serious misuse, though, of rules about personal conduct to try to make them into absolute rules that have no qualification in other contexts. Jesus also said, Give to him that asks of thee, and from him that would borrow, turn not away. That's verse 42 of the same chapter. Are those words without qualification? Do we have to give to everybody who asks us to give something to them? There are a lot of people I pass up on the streets. There are a lot of people who come into the church office asking for help that I don't give them help. Those words are qualified by passages like 2 Thessalonians 3.10, that if a man won't work, it's let him starve. On the matter of vengeance taking, Jesus has enjoined private citizens, whether Christians or non-Christians, from taking the law into our own hands. But he wasn't enjoining the state and its agents, whether Christian or non-Christian, from honoring and executing the law. In fact, if this directive from, from Matthew 5 about turning the other cheek is to be applied without qualification, Jesus himself sinned. He violated his own commandment. Because when he was before Annas in John 18, verses 22 and 23, he was slapped, but he didn't turn the other cheek. He protested the blow. He said, if I've done some evil, testify to it. But if I haven't, why did you slap me? Personal relations and words or blows of taunting and insult, they're one thing, and we're supposed to take that, turn the other cheek. But rights under law, our civil rights and protections under the law, the enforcement of law as an agent of the state, that's something else quite again. The teachings of Jesus are consistent on the rights that we have in both spheres. Third, someone might try to get around my explanation of Romans 13 by saying, but aren't we supposed to love our enemies? And isn't love inimical to force and certainly to the taking of life? Jesus taught Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is love for an enemy to be understood as the, as the supreme love in one's life? What about love for God or family or brethren or country? And if one is compelled to use force against an enemy who's threatening his family, for example, it would be perfectly reasonable to contend that such action, even to the point of taking life, was an act of love. Only once in my adult life have I been put into an actual situation where a man attacked my father. Fortunately, I was bigger than the man. And when I went after him and when I got my hands on him and when I restrained him and pulled him away and called for my brother and we escorted him away, I had no thought of hatred in my heart for that man. But I had thoughts of love in my heart for my father that would prohibit my sitting by while someone was threatening or harming me. It would never be right to strike or shoot somebody out of hatred for that person. But it would be right to use force against him because of love for the ones he was harming. Surely that's what Peter had in mind to do when he was going to defend Christ the night that the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. Jesus stopped that. Because Jesus had come for the purpose of dying and his hour had come. 
And Jesus told Peter not to throw away his sword, but to put it up, not to fight here. In fact, having sent out the disciples under the limited commission without any sort of weapon, Jesus told them in anticipation of their going out under the great commission that any of you who don't have a sword had better sell something else that you do have that you can spare and buy one. There are some situations where love and the use of force are perfectly compatible. If it is impossible to take life or use punity force against men in love, how do we explain the death of Ananias and Sapphira? Isn't God love? It wasn't it God who struck them down? How do we explain the fact that all impenitent sinners are going to have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone? The God of love is going to punish them. We ought to love our enemies in that while we're convinced they're wrong and desire to harm us, we refuse to hate them. To the contrary, we pray for them to turn from evil to righteousness. But that doesn't mean that our love must place us or those under our care at the mercy of an enemy while he's still impenitent and trying to do harm. Love for these people ob obliges us to stop it. What then are the conclusions that I urge you to accept? Number one, to see that Romans 13, 1 to 7 is consistent with everything the Bible says about vengeance taking. There's not a radical discontinuity in any period in terms of the ethics that God or his people have in, in any generation. When Noah came out of the ark and stood before God as the new head of the human race, the Lord said, Whoso sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man, Genesis 9, verse 6. That early rule established the death penalty for murder, there's no doubt. And the basis for the drastic penalty was man's in God's image, and if someone, someone murders, he's to pay with his life. All murder is killing, but not all killing is murder. Some killing is the execution of the murderer or the other sinner. And that death penalty for murder was retained under the law and it was also specified for another number of other offenses. And it's for this reason that the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder actually, the word there, doesn't prohibit all killing. It forbids unauthorized taking of life, murder, but not authorized killing, execution. Otherwise, look what an absurdity. Thou shalt not kill. Anyone kills, whatever the circumstance, he is to be killed. But somebody killed him, now then he has to be killed. The one who kills him, he has to be killed. And that goes on, I suppose, until the last man in Israel has killed the next to the last man, and then he commits suicide. No, the sixth commandment didn't prohibit all taking of life. It prohibited murder. The New Testament doesn't abolish capital punishment. It doesn't prohibit the maintenance of armies or the functioning, functioning of godly people within them. Jesus acknowledged capital punishment as a prerogative of the state. And when he was before Pilate, he didn't challenge Pilate's right as a representative of the state to execute the death penalty. He only challenged whether or not he was guilty as charged. And Paul did the same thing in Acts 25, verse 11. He said, if I've done something worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Paul's insistence was that he'd done that, that merited the death penalty. Scripture reflects progressive revelation from Adam through Moses and the prophets to Jesus and the apostles. But what we have to remind ourselves of is that progressive revelation in the Bible is not from error to truth. It wasn't that in the Old Testament men were acting unethically in executing certain people but it's from partial to complete. That's the progression in biblical revelation. The New Testament doesn't repudiate the state's right to take life. It doesn't dismiss divine legislation to the effect that it was barbaric or savage or enlightened back there when men were taking lives and God was striking people down with the blade of a righteous sword. Both testaments grant the right of the state to punish even to take life. Second, Romans 13 says that vengeance taking is not merely to be tolerated, but that it's a positive ministry to God. One cannot be legitimately spoken against for serving somewhere within that function. Now, if he perverts justice, a judge, a policeman, a soldier, 
If he abuses his power, if he merely masks murder in the name of serving the state, he sins. But if he fills his role justly so as to encourage good and oppose evil, he serves God. A policeman, a witness in a court, a member of a jury, a judge on a bench, the warden of a prison, the man who throws the switch on the electric chair, the soldier who shoots the rifle that takes the life or drops the bomb, ought to be respected and encouraged rather than taunted under those circumstances. There are men in this audience who served in World War II and other conflicts. I don't regard you as murderers. I'm grateful for what you did to preserve my freedom to stand in a pulpit and preach in a free country. And I believe you performed a ministry to God. Third, God's people ought to support governments in meeting their obligations in this regard. And beyond that, Christians ought to aspire to and fill positions of leadership within government. The best people, people who try to make decisions consistent with righteousness are the ones that we need to write the laws instead of the people who are writing them now. To sit on the bench, to enforce the law. We cannot divorce ourselves from society. And when we do, we need not be surprised that injustice abounds. Let God's people be peace lovers and peacemakers. I'm no warmonger. I have no bloodlust. Let's pray for the easing of tensions and the elimination of wars. But may we not be so naive as to think that permissive attitudes and minimal punishments are the means to that sort of stability. God has ordained civil governments to function for the good of its citizens by opposing evil firmly. And may we support rather than discourage it. So long as there's sin in the world, the lusts of wicked men are going to create wars. James 4.1 Whence come wars and fights? So long as Satan works his way in the hearts of men, there will be rape and there will be murder and other horrible crimes of man against his fellow man. It's not the will of God that good men and good causes be trampled underfoot when this onslaught of wickedness occurs within a society. God's ordained a ministry to oppose and fight and crush crime. And while we find no delight in war or the death of the ungodly, we realize that some people forfeit their right to live. God himself takes no pleasure in the death of anybody, says Ezekiel 18.32. Not even the death of the wicked man, says Ezekiel 33 verse 11. But God has destroyed a lot of people by opening the earth, by raining fire and brimstone, by sending out righteous blades. And so must children of God adopt an attitude of sorrowful duty in carrying out the divine edict. It's not pleasant, but it's right. A man stood up in America in a free pulpit to preach. He quoted detached sentences from the Christ, the Christ whose hand held the lash when his father's house was made a den of thieves and whose eyes were often as a flame of fire. The preacher declared that evil, no matter how diabolical, was never to be resisted with physical weapons, and rhetorically he asked, when has a sword ever accomplished anything worthwhile? In a pew was a worshiper whose heart was aching with a void and in whose home was a gold star, speaking of the valor of her son who'd marched forth with a righteous sword but who'd never come back. And at the church door following the service, that worshiper said to the preacher, I can tell you one thing the righteous sword has done. What, asked the minister? And the lady said, the sword in the hand of those who've resisted militant evil has given you the right to stand here today and to proclaim your convictions without fear of being liquidated. And after deep thought, the man said, I guess I can't refute that. There's no refutation in God's world for man to take the blade of the righteous sword and to wield it for the purposes that God has authorized in his holy word.